Uh, and this is perfect segue from who rides bikes to equity in cycling. Um, understand, so we understand who is riding. Now we need to talk about how to get other people riding the underserved community. How to make bicycling safe and accessible for everyone. So Philip Summers, MPH, was a research associate with the Department of Family and Community Medicine before joining the program in community engagement as an associate director. He has used his background in public health leadership in a variety of nonprofit organizations, both locally and globally. His research and practice focus on health and justice for immigrants and reducing health disparities. He is bilingual, English, Spanish. Philip is interested in a geographic information systems, uh, web-based data collection, and active transportation. He leads the day-to-day -day operations of the program and community engagement, serving as a liaison to faculty and community research interests. In his spare time, enjoys fixing and gifting bicycles with his neighbors in Walltown through a ministry he lovingly calls Salem Bicycle Works. Thank you, Jake. Yeah, give him a hand. Well, thank you for having me. Um, I'm, I'm proud that the institution I work for ended up being a sponsor of this event. I will say that I'm going to present some of our science, and so I'll try to use that register and that language, but some of these comments are going to be my own, so they don't reflect the, um, the institution, so to speak, so I'll, I might change my register a little bit, um, because it's, uh, it's hard for, but it is hard for me to disentangle. I, I am a bike rider, and I'm very interested in social justice, so I have a lot of my own opinions. Some of them aren't always informed by science, and sometimes science, we're just wrong-headed. So I want to say, take everything I say today with a grain of salt, uh, and, and, and feel free to be leery. Um, and feel free to ask questions as we go, and, and I'm happy to talk afterwards. One thing that I think is, is, is an important term, and it was in Amy's title, is this idea of intersectionality. And the way I understand intersectionality is really heartbreaking, right? So it's this idea that there are things that compound in your life that make, it, make you more structurally vulnerable or make it harder for you to do the things that we might enjoy. So I, I want to say it's a great privilege that I can ride my bike to work. I mean means that I have a wife who's willing to cart our kids around, it means I'm healthy, it means I have free time, it means I um, can maintain a bike. There's a lot of privileges that are encompassed in being a bike rider. So some of the things that intersect in my life help it be easier for me to engage in all these things that make me more healthy, right? I mean, I can maintain a healthy body weight because I ride my bike to work. Well. We have real problems with income inequality, uh, racial segregation. Uh, so uh, this idea of intersectionality can also compound and keep people more vulnerable. And that, that to me is heartbreaking. So sometimes it's hard when we have um, the immense of privilege that many of us enjoy to understand this kind of chasm between people who all the things are intersecting for their good and the people who are, all the things are intersecting for their bad. And we, sometimes we're a little too simplistic in saying, oh, well, pe you know, we should just give people bikes or we should, uh, we, we need to really understand that there's uh, a history and, and a legacy of inequality that um, has got us where we are today. So, um, I hope you can see that. Uh, this, if you can't, says the, this is out of the Center for Disease Control. So MPH does not stand for miles per hour. I have a, a master's in public health, and so <laughs> people who study public health are big fans of the Center for Disease Control. Um, they have a, a, a series of maps around health outcomes in the community. So this is our community, and there's probably I don't know, 30 maps in this series. And as I work at the medical center and try to educate doctors about, you know, the, the locality that they're practicing in, we often use maps. Um, and, and we have this narrative 
uh, for better or worse, around how 52 divides the community. So what you see here is a very important thoroughfare 52. And you'll notice that uh, in, in this instance, you, you, you don't want to be darker, right? This is the only map I'm going to show in this series, so I'm just trying to give you a little more background on it. But darker means you're not having much leisure time. And if you know this community, you know that the, the way of vistas of the world are to the west and the, uh, uh, the low income area, the less resourced folks live where it's darker. And so in this series of maps, you can, you can imagine they have maps on obesity, they have maps on hypertension. You know, I'm not showing that. What I'm showing you is who doesn't have leisure time, right? Like, so when I, when I say I can ride to work, well, that just means I have some discretionary time in my day. I'm not, I'm not like beholden to some schedule. I have, I have a lot of leisure time, right? And when you are constrained by your employment, you know, by housing segregation, by all these different things that can kind of conspire against you, one of the things you lack, besides cash, is leisure time. And uh, one of the things we're trying to work on locally is um, and if you've been here all day, you've heard me try to interject that transportation policy is a social justice issue. I totally agree with that. Um, if we want more people walking and biking and, and doing those things, well, the, the very foundation of that is a functioning uh, public transportation system. So in the work I do at the medical center, we convene stakeholders and they said, you know, one of our biggest problems locally is public transit. And so we set out to work on that uh, about two years ago um, to, to forecast policy change. And one, one of the ways that we're trying to advocate for policy change is just documenting what the reality is. And, and um, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call this out in a second. I should go ahead and do it. But this is ward by ward. And I'm so glad that Jeff McIntosh is here because the first time I presented this to City Hall, he was like, help me out. My ward's not even on there. So sometimes we make mistakes as data scientists, and I don't know how. But this analysis is pulling the Google API, and it's, doing, uh, it's calculating the amount of time it takes to ride the bus to key health out, uh, destinations. So that's the downtown health plaza. I mean, and you can't really read it. I apologize. It's just saying. We need to support expansion of transit to, so that people have greater equity in moving around our community. And this call out just shows you that currently it takes a, uh, from 27 to 83 minutes with an average of 53 minutes to get from the different wards to our main hospital or to the downtown health plaza. We did all this fancy talk just to say the bus has only run once an hour. If the bus has ran more frequently, those travel times would come down. Uh, Friday, they, uh, several routes um, are enjoying greater frequency because of Business 40 closure. So Business 40 is going to do something interesting in our community. We're, Matthew mentioned the multi-use path, right? So that's going to be transit oriented. There's like three pedestrian bridges. I mean, there's a lot of good things. But it was also is, is an infusion of cash towards our transit system. So we're trying to advocate for let's, in, let's take a look around and take inventory during this year of the closure how people might walk and get around more and bike more when they have greater uh, frequency in the transit service because of this grant by the North Carolina Department, Transpor D Department of Transportation. So, and the current time spending walking to public transit, it's just, it's a really large range. And so, um, when we think about things like intersectionality and who does and does not have leisure time, it has to do with poverty, right? So if you're transit dependent, a lot of the other things that we put out is that, you know, folks who are transit dependent mean they haven't overcome the economic hurdle of owning a car, right? So they're just really, um, we need to have a little more vision around what it means to get all folks around. And it is older people. Studies show that when you expand transit, it's older people on fixed incomes who often take advantage of more rides. So again, as a public health thinker, we're, we're getting older and unfortunately we're getting sicker as a country. So we're going to need to do things that improve our infrastructure to help us get around. And so I'm really high on public transit as one of those things. We're talking about biking, but biking and public transit go hand in hand. So again, I'm going to go back uh, to some study findings. Um, I was so glad to see Tony McGee in some of those photos. Um, through some of our stakeholder engagement, we had pulled together a group that was really interested in bicycling. And we, 
we wrote a proposal. One of the sad things about being an academic is all your proposals don't get funded. So this proposal didn't get funded, but we, we still had enough of internal money to, to, to pilot it. So what I'm going to tell you now is some pilot work we did, and we were calling it ABCD. What do you think ABC stood for? ABCD, ABCD stood for? Assessing bicycling, well, no, assessing barriers to cycling diversity. Whenever you write a grant, you're always looking for some snappy like acronyms. So <laughs> assessing barriers to cycling diversity. How are we going to assess barriers to cycling diversity? We wanted to do citizen science. So if I tell you I do community engagement, one of the things we want to do is we want people to get excited about science. And we thought, what if we trained people to do systematic observations of greenways? And I, I'm sad that Gary's not here. Uh, Gary, uh, well, he was here in the morning, and many of you know and love Gary. But he was one of the citizen scientists who faithfully went out on greenways and made observations. And we had a you know, fancy data portal where they could log their observations. And what you're seeing in this map hopefully you can see it, um, or where we made observations. And I think Amy did a good job of pretty much saying that predominantly it's white, rich males who ride bikes. And that's the national trend. And we can read the literature and understand that. But we wanted to understand it here locally. And we found that's pretty much the case. And I'm not just trying to jump to the findings, but I also want to stay on time here. I'm going to show you another map here in a second. But this is just showing you. Uh, five different locations. I hope we can identify Salem Lake, an important location, Brushy Fork Greenway, Salem Strollway, 4th Street. I think Matt, you know, you heard Matt talking about how many people go up and down 4th Street. And then that's at Haynes Park. And you can see that pink is the predominant thing we observed. So we trained probably about 100 people to make these systematic observations. That was who we saw doing moderate intensity bike riding. Um, and like I said, we trained 100 people. And it was really interesting. One of the reasons we wanted to do it was to understand citizen science. So we also wanted to know um, how long they were out there. So they stood out there for about 81 minutes. And our average person saw about 49 people. So the, the kind of the takeaway here, um, this is essentially showing the same thing, but these people are vigorously. So we were always trying to put people in buckets. And one of the buckets was like, how fast were they riding their bike? You know, at what level of like physical activity they were getting. But kind of the takeaway is of the, of the people we saw, pretty much we saw mainly white male men. We did see some people of, of, of other varieties, but um, it, w it wasn't an earth-shattering finding. It was a small sample. We, our endeavor was really to try to see if we could do citizen science. Um, not many people have seen these results. Again, they're not that earth-shattering. It kind of confirms what we all know. Do you have a question? You're welcome to have a question if you want to. But, um, so. That was one side of our study. Um, we wanted to observe the greenways. You know, we worked with Matt. We, we, um, we purposely chose those locations because there's passive counters. We thought we were going to be able to compare our data to the passive counter. We we're going to be very scientific. But I don't know that it really worked out that way because we had a lot of students. We were like, you know, it, how, right, by show of hands, who's a, familiar with the Christmas bird count? So the, the, the bird count is an example of citizen science, right? Like people are going to go out on Christmas and count birds. So we were trying to like get in line with that. And we just kind of ran into some of our own hurdles. So this is, this is not going to appear anytime soon in the New England Journal of Medicine. But it is local findings for your community about who we saw. What, what I'm going to talk about next is where I'm going to blur the line again between my personal experiences. There's going to be a lot of photos of my family and some of my work with Salem Bicycle Works. But it's also, we did 20 interviews um, with, so this is called qualitative research. We, did, we, we interviewed 10 African American bike riders and 10 African American non riders. And some of the themes of what they said that helped support their desire to ride, or some of the barriers to why they didn't ride. Um, and then again, this is like pilot research, so I decided to intervene 
And really, you're, the photos you're going to see are over the last eight years. So it was before we had some of these findings, we were already kind of endeavoring to do some of these things. So that's where it just gets a little bit blurry. But I want to say that some of the concepts, and I'll try to put an asterisk in some, some of the places where we, we found. Any questions before I depart from citizen science? Did it totally rock your world? All right. Oh, yeah, go for it. You know, our best citizen scientists were, were, fr were, were probably retirees, um, and so through some of their networks. Um, I mean, we ended up training 100 people. That was because we were working with some folks at Winston-Salem State, so like a bunch of PE students did it for credit, but then they didn't really follow through, and that, that was, so again, I could, I could give a whole presentation on citizen science, and I'm happy to like talk more about it, but you want to really have people who are available, who are really interested in the, in, in the topic. I think that's why the Christmas bird count really works. It's like those people like care about birds, you know, and so just trying to find the issue and the people who have the availability, um, those, are, those are some of the things to consider. Uh, okay. So, this is, I think he said, he said in my bio, I live in Walltown, and you, you know, in public health, we, we sometimes talk about, and in planning, you talk about things like placemaking and history, and I have a lot of photos with me and bikes in front of the Shell station, and the reason that is, is because that's like historic place, and it's, it's something we're proud of, I mean, if we said earlier that 52 is kind of the dividing line, and if I live on the wrong side of the tracks, we want you to know we got some cool things on the wrong side of the tracks, too. And the Shell Station's one of them. And so when people come to my house and they're like, what, what are you doing living over here, Philip? You know, this is, I always take them on a bike ride down to the Shell Station because it's, a, um, it's just a reminder of, 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 a, of a different era. Um, these, this next photo, I'm, I'm so glad we moved it here so I can cheat and see what's, what's next. But in this photo, um, you have uh, Buck Wilson in the middle. And I, don't, I, I really want to give a, a plug to the journal. Um, it's really not even a story about me, but there was a story about me in the Winston-Salem Journal a few months ago. And what I loved about the story was how they interviewed Buck and how they interviewed some of the other neighbors. Because what we're trying to do is create place and build social capital. And so these are like protective things for people's health, their connectivity. So um, Buck Wilson scrap metals and it just realized that as he scrap metals, we could redeem bikes out of the scrap metal. So we have been giving away bikes. So we've given away uh, quite, a, quite a number of bikes um, out of the scrap metal. I was giving a presentation like this about two years ago at the Center for Design Innovation and uh, Chris Culp from Summit School saw it and said, hey, you know, we, our students could fix bikes for you. And so since I've been partnering with Summit School, we've given away a lot more bicycles because um, if, if you don't know, Summit School uh, is, is, a, is a, a school that has plenty of means, and so they have bicycles that they're ready to be shed of, and they find their way over to the south side um, via Salem Bicycle Works. But it really all started because this man would uh, scrap metal and was willing to, and realized there was more value in a bike than the scrap metal value. And since I was willing to take the time to fix them up, and we're neighbors, we, we were able to work that out. Uh, one of the things that we realize in our qualitative research is people lack skills in maintaining bikes. Um, and you, you see some parity, at least I see some parity in this with the idea of cooking. So sometimes um, you hear people lamenting about obesity because we you know, are eating prepared foods or going out to eat too much and we've lost this ability to cook. Well, I would argue one of the reasons we don't ride bikes is because we've lost the ability to change a tire or to, I, I love it when people call me and they, do you know how to fix a gearbox? And I'm like, that, you know, that's not what you call a, a bicycle shifter or whatever, but, um, but that's how they call it, you know, like my gearbox is messed up, you know, and so this is a photo, uh, and I wanted to include it just to pay tribute to my father. Um, he was always like inspiring me to try to be a jack of all trades, but a master of none. He, he could fix my bike when I was little, and I thought, looked up to him for that. And, um, and in turn, you know, we would fix neighbors' bikes when I was little. And so this is a picture of my dad helping me 
fix up some of uh, the neighborhood kids' bikes. And the reason this is important is because you want them to have a sense of self-esteem, right? You want them to understand how their, uh, their equipment is working. Um, and we got a grant from the North Carolina Department of Public Health. They issued a small award for faith communities. I go to church at the Enterprise Center, or we, our church meets at the Enterprise Center. It's a really cool um, multi-use space. They have a, uh, an event center, and our church meets there on Sunday. So, but the North Carolina Public Health Department said, faith communities, we want you guys to have people bike to church, and we'll give you one of these mechanic stands. And so this is, I think it's... The, well, it was the first, and now there's one at Salem Lake. I'm looking back, back, back there for Matt. And, and, and now, and, and my Salem Lake buddy's there, and you know it's been vandalized, right? Like, I, I needed to get that on, on, the, on the ticket. I hate to call you out in the meeting, but I run at Salem Lake all the time, and I'm like watching, you know, I'm, I'm like, I care about these things. So if you don't know, these are just like publicly accessible tools so people can fix their own bikes. Um, and, and we have one um, on Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard. Uh, this is a picture of my dear neighbor who helped me pour the concrete to put it in. Um, I mentioned Chris Culp earlier. We, we gave out about 30 bikes at the Neighborhood Day this two, about two months ago. And one of the things while we were doing as we were giving out bikes is we were also fixing Neighborhood Kids' bikes. Um, so we, I'm trying to make sure I stay on topic here of intersectionality, but what, one of the harsh realities I see and living in Walltown is people can get a bike, you know, they get a Walmart bike, it's really hard to fix, it's really low quality, but as soon as you get a flat tire, it's like sidelined, right? Like if you, you, don't, you don't have a way to get to Walmart to get a new tube, you don't know how to fix it, and so we are trying to address that by um, teaching kids how to fix their flat tires and providing the tools and and really, I'm doing more salvaging of bike tires. I'm actually more interested in your old crappy Walmart bike that you want to give me for the tire in it than the bike, because the bike is really hard to fix, but tubes are really durable. And I can, there's some other kid out there who's just got a flat tire that I could really help. Um, so we give bikes to kids to try to get them on bikes. We give bikes to adults because they have new goals of um, um, you know, improving their health. Certainly one of the qualitative findings was, you know, I would ride a bike if I had one. It doesn't really cross my mind. You know, it's not really high on the, like, um, needs list. So, like, but there are plenty of adults out there, like, if you say, oh, I'll be glad to give you a bike, um, that they'll take and use. Because I ride a bike to work, I get to see people walking to work. This gentleman, I, I, I pulled over the other day because... I, for as many good stories I have, I have sad stories too, so I don't want you to think this is all like, oh, Philip is just out there, Johnny Appleseeds of bikes. This guy's, I, I, I pulled over and I said, can I use your picture in this, in this presentation? Because I gave him this bike, I don't know, eight months ago, and he has been faithfully riding it to work. And it's like, I pass him going to work, and, and so... I think she was talking about how people in poverty will ride more for transportation. And so as someone who rides for transportation, I get excited when I see folks riding for transportation. I also get excited when I see my friends with Black Girls Bike out riding. Um, this was a day, it was just really sweet. Um, I'm riding back from Pilot Mountain. I'm just cashed, you know. I mean, I, I biked up. I think it was Easter. I biked up and camped out and was biking home from Pilot Mountain. and. Um, they pulled over and just chatted me up. You rode where? You rode how long? And um, it's, again, I'm going to jump back into the qualitative findings. Having social support is a really important thing for getting people to ride. And so, um, well, I'm not a big beer drinker. I'm going to drink a beer later today. So, but something like beers and gears, something like beers and gears is about social support, right? It's about, it's like, just have fun, come out and ride. Uh, and that's what Black Girls Bike does. Um, that's what we're doing in this picture here. This is a friend of mine. Um, so where a lot of poor people live, they live in very cut off places that are hard to find and hard to bike from. And they're not even going to consider doing it. And so we were going to have a picnic through the church. And I said, let me come over. and Because and I, I knew he could ride his bike that far, but it was just like the barrier of doing it the first time. Uh, and so it was just some of that social support of like, we'll ride with you to the, pic the church picnic, you know, like we're going anyway and we think it's fun. And 
So just tr trying to make bike, biking a celebration and like more normal and, and giving people just a little bit of support. Because um, you can have a bike and it just sit there and, because there's, there's other barriers. So social support is a, is a big thing. Um, I, I couldn't give this present. I, I, like, iPhones make it really easy just to document your life. I don't take that many pictures, but I had to have a picture of Jake. This was like, I think even the, before the first day of the bike share opening. So that same group assessing barriers to cycling diversity was also trying to say, oh, we're so excited about a bike share. Um, and, and we wanted to understand the implementation of that and, and who would take advantage of uh, bicycling. And so, I um, got. <laughs> well, uh, I have about a million and one photos of, of the bike share because I was giving out passes to the bike share and trying to get people on it. But it's it's really interesting because we've already had a lot of conversations about the bird scooters. I, I want to make sure I, I lend my voice to the the chorus that's saying it's exciting to see an innovation that's getting people on the streets. And I think this notion of being vulnerable. So on a bicycle, you're very vulnerable. You don't have a ton of steel around you. You don't have this power of going 60 miles an hour. It's a very like humble way to get about. And I, I'm grateful for bicycles and scooters because they, they're just a little more humane way to get around. and. And there's not quite the um, economic barriers, right? I mean, owning a car is, is expensive. And um, so I've, I've been just trying to intentionally expose uh, some of my young neighbors and friends to the joys of riding a bike in the innovation corridor or, or, um, or whatnot. Because you, you want to like have people see themselves doing it. You know, you want them to. Um, realize that it's, it's there for them as well. And I just think I've seen a lot, that a lot quicker with the bird scooters than I did with the bike share. I mean, I'm like dragging people to be like, come on, ride the bike share, whereas the bird scooters, people are, it's really neat to see people are using it as a cottage industry. And, and, and I wanted to come back to this point of just like public space. Like I, I think streets, if, if it was this new co uh, concept you've heard today, this vision zero, right? It's just this idea of streets should be safe places and no life should be lost. And that would include pedestrians and bike riders and transit riders. And so it can have a very like high value of human life. Um, and and I, I think we've, we kind of got a little sideways in our country with power and car and consumption. And so to the extent that we can value human life and pedestrians through humane, humane ways to convey ourselves like bikes and buses. Um, I think that holds out a lot of promise. It's very ideal, but I think our community is close. What we probably lack is uh, a little bit of harmony. Um, we, we wrote this policy brief around fare free transit and you see fare free across the country in university dominated towns and we're not a university dominated town. We have a lot of universities, but there's not like a lot of harmony, right? There's different like fractures in our community that in some ways we need to figure out how we can collaborate to get to visions of better economic mobility, better, um, better connectivity. I mean, I was really glad when Lindsay was bringing up this idea of connectivity. You certainly have the innovation corridor as this rising potential that could really maybe heal the, the, the big divides between the haves and the have-nots in our community. And so I think to the extent that we think about connecting um, and, and becoming a more integrated Winston-Salem, we'll have more of, of a term that I'm more enamored with, with this, this commonwealth or common health so that we're not uh, so individualistic in thinking in our well-being, but we're thinking more collectively in our well-being. So uh, I'll leave you with this last slide that just has my contact information. Um, I, you, you know, I, I was enjoying putting together photos, and this is my, I call this my minivan. Um, and so this is Forest Park. Uh, this picture is taken at Forest Park. It's a really great example of joint use. So it's a 
elementary school, but it's also a recreation space. And I want to call out, my kids don't have on helmets. I don't want to be flippant about that, but I also want to say that one of the reasons we ride around our neighborhood without helmets is because a lot of our poor neighbors don't wear helmets, or if you give them helmets, they don't keep up with it. But we still want them riding bikes. Like, so I think we have to, we always have to, again, this is, we have whole parts of Baptists that give away helmets, so I'm not speaking for Baptists. I'm speaking as Philip, who really cares about biking and wants to get people involved. And so I think we have to be careful when we uh, are so strident about things like helmets or, uh, you know, we want people just to be out in space and being able to recreate and enjoy time. And so I, I really enjoy biking with my kids. You can say a prayer for us because sometimes we'll bike to the downtown school and people are like, are you crazy? You have your kids biking to the downtown school? So Walltown, the downtown school is pretty far, but my kids enjoy it so much. And so somehow it just feels like a risk worth taking but I don't want to be flippant about that either. You know, the last thing I would want is one of my kids to get hit by a car. So it's real issues around like, how do you um, try to be faithful to this idea of being healthy and being well and being active and not beholden to consumption or um, individual transportation? You know, how do you um, get to these higher ideals of solidarity? I mean, certainly, um, there are just great examples out there in cities where you have more of a pedestrian infrastructure and more public space. You have more opportunities for solidarity and more opportunities for shared understanding as opposed to like the polarization and the divides that we have currently. So I don't know that the bicycle can heal all that. I know that it's really enriched my life and I continue to ride because it's fun and sometimes I even get to do it at work. I mean, study bicycles at work. But I think I'm right up against my time, so I'm going to try to leave it there, and I'm going to stay the rest of the day for for the happy hour. So if, if we don't, if I if I didn't leave enough time for questions, you can hit me up. All right, that sounds good. All right. Thank you. Yep.